Welcome to this roundtable discussion on the new tax law passed in December and the potential impact on the arts in Massachusetts. While there are many topics related to the new law worth exploring, the intention of this panel is to initiate the conversation as it relates to the arts, especially nonprofit arts organizations. With me today here at Somerville Media Center is Tanya Metla, Director of Government Affairs at Massachusetts Nonprofit Network. Tanya drives their advocacy on public issues, collaborating with their members, government officials, and external partners. She works closely with their 750 plus members to develop their positions on issues, primarily at the state level. Also with me is Emily Ruddock, who serves as Mass Creative's program advocate, working to advance a policy platform for a more vibrant and creative Massachusetts with government officials, opinion leaders, and advocacy partners. Emily was the first director of the Downtown Lynn Cultural District, working with city leaderships and artists towards a more creative downtown. For over a decade, Emily worked as a theater producer and casting director. My name is Anabel Vasquez Rodriguez, a visual artist, curator, and organizer based between Providence, Boston, and San Juan. I'm currently curator at Leica Gallery Boston and on the board of of directors for the Dirt Palace Public Projects in Providence. Let's get to it. On December 22nd, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act became law, cutting the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. The top individual tax rate will drop to 37%. It also cuts income tax rates, doubles the standard deduction, and eliminates personal exemptions. The corporate cuts are permanent while the individual changes expire at the end of 2025. From an arts perspective, charitable giving is expected to take a hit, with the Arts Action Fund projecting a loss of $20 billion annually as a result of the significant reduction in the number of taxpayers who can still itemize deductions. So I'll start with Emily. Uh, this leads us to where the organizations stand. Um, for viewers who are not familiar with uh, Mass Creative, what does your organization do, and what, if any, impact do you see on funding for the arts? Sure. So Mass Creative is the statewide arts advocacy organization. Um, we really believe in mobilizing artists, creative makers, and people who care about arts and culture in their community to get involved and uh, make sure that their, cities, uh, their city leadership is aware of mm -hmm. um, how much they care about the arts. Um, one of the things that we really try to do is be proactive in terms of organizing people mm -hmm. ahead of issues, make sure they know what's happening with that issue, um, wh which is what we did with the tax law. And have people been coming up to you, like, to how to get prepared for this um, tax uh, changes that are coming? Sure. I think there's a lot of questions, and I think Tanya's going to talk a little bit about that because there's a lot we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, Again, we really tried to make sure that people understood the process with which this bill became a law mm -hmm. um, and when were the moments to really reach out to their uh, legislators to say, I want this or we're really uncomfortable with this. Okay. And Tanya, what is the mission of the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network and how closely have you been following this? Uh, tax reform. Sure. So the Mass Nonprofit Network is the Commonwealth's Nonprofit Association. Um, and so we um, unite and strengthen the sector through advocacy, public awareness, and capacity building. Um, we represent all the subsectors um, and really in every region of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got engaged on tax reform at the beginning of 2017. Uh, the first thing we really had to do was make sure nonprofits understood why this bill was going to impact them. Mm -hmm. It's not obvious. Um, because it, there, there was discussion about the charitable tax deduction, but there's a bunch of things, moving pieces in the bill that impact giving, that impact donors, that impact how nonprofits operate. Um, so we were engaged early um, and working with our colleagues down in DC at the National Council of Nonprofits, we're able to mobilize members like Mass Creative 
talk about the issue um, and engage our federal delegation on it. Right on. Um, so let's break down the terms art funding. Um, I think that'd be really helpful because there's a lot to arts and culture. Um, there are grants to individual artists, there's nonprofits, but also mid-sized donations by corporations and individuals to small to medium nonprofit organizations and major donations by corporations and wealthy individuals to larger institutions as well for profit art sales and galleries. Um, Emily, is this an accurate summation of where the money is changing hands in the arts and who of these groups might expect the most changes uh, in funding you know, compared to previous years? Sure, it, it's fairly accurate. I think the one group that you didn't really mention, and it's interesting that you didn't mention them, is uh, the government. Mm -hmm. So state uh, and local governments do also have granting programs. And so ours, um, our, the state of Massachusetts has the Mass Cultural Council, um, which uh, they appropriate money every year towards the programs, the granting programs that the Mass Cultural Council has. However, um, in a recent study in 2015, the Boston Foundation did a study and the report that came out was compared to peer cities like San Francisco and Philadelphia, our um, government public giving is so much lower. So you're right to say that mm -hmm. it's mostly individuals because we're really overly reliant on individuals giving to arts nonprofits, um, which means that with these tax changes, we're... Uh, organizations, regardless of budget size, will really see an impact in terms of who's giving, uh, in terms of the amounts that are being given. And um, just quickly, but the, uh, the government funding and you know, organization, uh, parts like the NEA, for example, mm -hmm. isn't that more of a budget issue than a tax issue? That has to do with the budget. Sure, like it the does. It has to do with the budget, but I think it's a good point to illustrate that like in a moment where we're seeing a real change in the makeup of how much people, or the makeup of how nonprofit organizations raise dollars, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that there's one group that we, we have a hunch is gonna go down, and there's, we don't see a lot of right now, we don't see a lot of government dollars that are balancing it out. So it, it's gonna be a larger impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, and just to add to that, mm -hmm. um, the tax bill was a, was a $1.5 trillion um, tax cut, and that is gonna impact the federal budget. Mm -hmm. We don't yet know exactly how, but most of us are um, guessing that there's going to be cuts on domestic spending, and that mm -hmm. will impact groups that depend on federal funding. Um, and so more of that to come, but, but we know that they're gonna to have to find that money to make up for the tax cut somewhere. So what do you think are the immediate you know, impacts to individuals and mid-sized and small organizations? Sure, so, so similar to arts uh, nonprofits, um, individual gimi giving is the number one source of giving uh, mm -hmm. for our members and for most nonprofits. So every year, uh, MN surveys our members and we find year after year uh, that the sort of uh, number one source of revenue is individual giving. For our members, it's over 80% of their budget. Um, and so what this bill did was it doubled the standard deduction. Um, and right now there is a federal charitable tax deduction. It's very important, the bill didn't touch that. But what it did was it's gonna change the amount of people who continue to itemize. By doubling the standard deduction, a lot of Americans, it's gonna make a, a lot more sense for them to take the standard deduction and to no longer itemize. And if you're not itemizing, you can't access the charitable tax deduction. And so one of the things we were saying down in DC and to our federal delegation is, an unintended consequence of doubling the standard deduction is impacting the amount of people um, who will give. You're basically making the cost of giving go up for some Americans. Um, and and we, we see this with small nonprofits, medium and large alike. Um, and so we, we're saying right now to our members, you know, regardless of your size, this could impact you know, the entire sector and we need to pay attention and learn all that we can. Okay, thank you. Um, so just a quote from Americans for the Arts. Total private sector uh, giving to the arts and culture charities was $18.21 billion in 2016, with the majority coming from individuals. Charitable giving to nonprofit organizations represents 30 to 60 percent of the typical nonprofit organization's budget. And then just to be clear, the charitable deduction 
is still in place, as you mentioned, um, but it will be narrowed down. Um, so Tanya, does 30 to 60% figure match up with what you're seeing? And are nonprofits anticipating uh, you know, a different direction? And what concerns, if any, would be coming to Massachusetts Nonprofit Network? Sure. Yeah, it does match up. And I think if, if anything, a lot of our members, they rely on individual donations even more. Okay. Um, and looking at the numbers just in Massachusetts, um, you know, back in 2015, about a million people in Massachusetts itemized their deduction um, or itemized their taxes and so were eligible for the charitable deduction. Um, that's about a third of taxpayers. If if this new change, if you can estimate maybe five to 10% of those will no longer itemize, that's hundreds of millions of dollars potentially in lost giving just in our state alone. Um, and so I think what, what the first question people are asking is, there's a lot of questions about what was in the tax bill, what wasn't, because you had the House bill, mm -hmm. which contained a lot of information, you had the Senate bill, and then they went to what's called a conference committee and they had to come up with was sort of the final bill. So our first thing that we're doing is educating members and nonprofits across the state about what the law is now. Um, and then the second thing they're having to do is think about their fundraising, think about their donors, and try to understand what the impact would be. And this, a lot of us won't know that, probably for years we're gonna have to collect data, but we need to start thinking about it now and know that there's gonna be donors um, you know, who are impacted by it. And so in looking at, at the breakdown, um, you know, low income donors who are never using um, the charitable deduction, th they're probably gonna give the same um, if financially they can because they, they were never taking advantage of the federal charitable tax deduction. Really high income donors, again, will probably give the same because they're still gonna itemize their taxes and they're still gonna have access to the full federal charitable tax deduction. It's that middle group, the middle income donors, who probably now for tax purposes will take the standard deduction. That is the group who we're not saying they're not gonna give anymore. We're saying the amount they give might be impacted by this tax bill. And so we really need to pay attention to what's going on. Would you say that um, mid-sized arts nonprofits rely over half of its budget on donations? And how can the nonprofit diversify where it gets its money from. Yeah, I mean, I, so again, in that study that the Boston Foundation put out that really looked at how small, mid-sized, and, and uh, larger arts organizations are, are getting their, their support, their, their investment, um, I think it would be, I think, I think technically it's a little under half, but it is significant. Okay. Um, and, the, and the point being is that there are other places where the public where public support for the arts can happen. So the state budget is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, that If that number comes up and actually makes a more healthy um, part of the pie of how an, an arts organization uh, raises money. I think the other thing to just to note, right, is that um, the, the cost of a ticket or the cost to get into an event or to a performance the, the estimate is, is that really covers about 30% of what you're seeing or, or attending or enjoying. Um, and so, so that's another part of that calibration, right? Like, so mm -hmm. the um, amount that you're paying in tickets is only a small percentage of what it really takes to make the work happen. So what could be the impact to that shrinking donor base among the different organizations, like throughout Massachusetts? Sure, so throughout Massachusetts. So, so again, so think, so, so they're going to have to find the money somewhere. So one of the places that it might be is we may see those ticket prices go up. Or um, another unintended consequence may be that some of the free programming that we all enjoy across the state may go down. Um, nonprofit organizations are going to have to make some really tough choices about what's the programs that they can continue to do. And um, we as the general public who appreciate the arts and culture that's in our own backyard as, across, as well as across the state, um, may see that change a little bit. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, what we're saying to members is there's probably not going to be a silver bullet. There's, mm -hmm. there's not going to be one piece of advice that we can give that's going to solve sort of the challenges from the tax bill. Um, but going back to fundraising basics and really thinking about this bill, thinking about your donor base 
and getting them really invested in the mission of your organization is going to be more important now really than ever. Because if someone is invested in the work that you're doing and in programs, they're more likely to keep giving even without the added tax benefit. Um, and so we're, we're talking to people about looking at your impact statements, really looking at your mission, and making sure you have a really fine-tuned development plan. Um, I also think engaging in public policy is really critical. So this past Tuesday, we were actually down at the State House because what our legislature is doing right now is they're looking at the state impacts from federal tax reform. And so what our leaders here in Massachusetts are trying to figure out is how is this going to impact the state budget? And how is it going to impact the different sectors? And one of the parts of that conversation was the Massachusetts nonprofit sector. Um, and so we're, we're engaged, um, foundations are engaged, and we're really having this conversation so that policymakers know that because this is going to potentially be a tough couple years for nonprofits, now is not the time to be putting cuts in the budget or decreasing spending on important programs that nonprofits deliver. And so I think being really engaged and um, and with groups like Mass Creative, with groups like ours that are really down at the state house and paying attention and being proactive is going to be key so that you're not sort of caught off guard when it's December 31st and all of a sudden you didn't get quite as many donations as you have been planning on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like keeping them engaged but also engaging yourself with policy and organizations like yourself and even what you mentioned earlier about starting to collect data, I think. You know, and like studying what are the impacts even in a, in a short scale. Um, so let's um, talk about individuals, right? Uh, artists mostly are contractors and freelancers. I know I was for almost uh, 15 years. So, you know, we're the 1099 economy, you know. Uh, it could be years where I would get like 10 W9s. <laughs> like, what do I do with this? Um, so with a 1099 form, uh, no taxes or deductions are taken on the same way as someone who has a pay who's on payroll. But roughly one fourth should be set aside for a freelancer to, to pay at the end of the day. So there's that along with the fact that support tends to be in the form of reimbursement grants, such as here uh, in Somerville with the Somerville Arts Council LCC grants rather than direct grants. Um, and I'll address this to Emily. It's not really a secret that Boston is super expensive. Uh, <laughs> I think it might be the second or third uh, ex most expensive city in the United States. Um, and it also has one of the highest in inequalities in the nation. How has grant funding to artists keep up with the cost of living? And is that expected to change? Um, it hasn't kept up with the cost of living. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like, saying. quite quite honestly. <laughs> and and um, it, it just hasn't. So I, I don't know that we have a lot of ideas about how the tax law will will affect that since the, the funding hasn't a, as of yet. You know, one of the things that I'm a little um, interested to see is how Governor Baker's housing bill, um, which he is, which is about increasing the housing stock, um, will affect artists and that there's opportunity there for um, more artist ha housing to happen in the area. Because it is, for me, it was more like housing, what housing, <laughs> right? right? For artists, I've never right. uh, really experienced that in Boston, so. I think one of the things, I mean, I learned through the tax bill is that it really unites the nonprofit sector in the way that it impacts housing, the way that it impacts the arts community, um, philanthropy, you name it. Um, and that when we're sort of all united, um, we have a much stronger force. One of the things we discovered last year in doing some research was the nonprofit sector is 17% of ma the Massachusetts economy. You know, one in six people in the state work for a nonprofit. Um, and that's a great sort of figure. You know, that's billions of dollars going back to the state in mm -hmm. wages um, and others. And so the more we can talk about us as a sector and a really strong, important part of the economy, the more that I think that lawmakers, that stakeholders, that the business community really sees, you know, a lot of what makes Massachusetts such a great place to live and work is a healthy and strong nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. um, that's what people are looking for when they come. They look at our universities, our hospitals, our cultural institutions. And so we, what we want to make sure with this tax bill is that it's not going to negatively impact not just the Massachusetts economy, but all the nonprofits doing all the great work, um, a lot of the work that they're doing 
more efficiently and effectively than if the government was doing themselves. Um, and so we sort of have to stay united as a sector um, and make sure we're at the table talking about the impacts um, and talking about you know, what this is gonna mean for the future of our sector here in Massachusetts. So Pat Roberts from the Senate from Kansas introduced a last minute amendment right on the version of the bill. It didn't make it into the final version. Um, his amendment would have struck artists from the list of qualified groups who benefit from federally uh, subsidized low income housing. So this amendment didn't make it, but it did draw attention on how tenuous artist housing can be. Um, Pat Roberts, Roberts is a great example of what Tanya was talking about. So we got word that <clears throat> um, at a last minute moment, he crossed out the name artist um, and, and removed them from the qualified groups for low income housing. And very quickly, we as a sector, as uh, nonprofits and, and artists and nonprofit arts organizations reached out aggressively to our um, federal delegation. And that was, this was actually across the country to say, that's not right. You can't do that. This is, this is what it will mean for us. Um, and particularly during that reconciliation period of the, the two bills and that conferencing to reach out to all of our members uh, of the federal delegation who are a part of that to say, you can't do that. And so that's a, that's a victory we can take is yeah. that when we organized and reached out and took on our own agency, we were able to stop something that could potentially really have a, a negative impact on, on the arts sector. And that goes back to just being more active, right? In exactly. the future and also keeping an eye, being in touch with folks like you so that, you know, who are working directly with policy in the state to kind of be the voice, um, but also individuals have the voice and they can write to the representatives and kind of push stuff forward. Um, so, you know, there's this thing about C corporation. I don't really understand too much, but um, it's, it's the status under individual artists could form a C corporation and be subject to the new lower 21% corporate tax that was previously 35. Is forming a corporation new territory for artists? Um, and are there any trends in Massachusetts artists, you know, like within Massachusetts artists that are doing this? Do you know? Of? I mean, you know, I can't really give sort of tax or legal advice. I think the one thing I heard when I was at this hearing at the State House the other day is this is all brand new and, and tax law is so individualized. And so, mm -hmm. so while what's happening at the federal level is important to pay attention to, what deductions went away, what exemptions went away, the state has its own tax code, right? And with its own exemptions, with its own um, you know, particular pieces. And so one thing, you know, the advice I got there was um, don't act too quickly until you sort of can really understand what's going on. Um, and so sort of, you know, it, um, talk to the, the right tax people. Um, I think a lot of tax professionals right now are working as fast as they can to come up to speed. I mean, this really was passed in the last week of the year. Um, you know, the IRS is trying to write regulations. They're trying to do it really quickly. Um, there's going to be new withholding tables. There's a lot going on here in Massachusetts. There's going to be a cap on state and local um, tax deductions, which is going to impact a lot of people with high property taxes. Um, and so you're certainly going to have to get advice from tax professionals. Um, th there's also been some talk that because this bill was done so quickly that there are um, issues. I know I saw a tweet sort of at the end of the year with handwriting on the actual bill. So it was being passed so fast that literally people were handwriting text that then became law. And so there has been some discussion that they might have to go back and make some technical corrections. Um, and you can imagine a lot of groups will get re-engaged again with the hopes of adding something. Um, so one of the things we had been working with a coalition of partners on was for a universal charitable tax mm -hmm. deduction. Okay. Um, and what that would have done was make giving more fair. And so what we think is, is everyone should be incentivized to give regardless of income, um, because giving is really great. It's one of the tax benefits that, that you can give to someone else and you're sort of getting nothing directly in return, unlike sort of like a mortgage interest deduction or something like that. Um, and what we don't want is to only incentivize giving by the most wealthy. Um, and so we're gonna continue to push for that. It actually did have bipartisan support. 
I think the hardest piece of that was it cost money. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point in the bill, they were already at 1.5 trillion and they were looking to sort of save money, not add to, uh, to the federal deficit. But that's gonna be something we're gonna continue to engage on with a national coalition of partners to really talk about um, everyone should be incentivizing giving in communities. Um, another thing we're looking at is there is a state charitable tax deduction on the books. It is currently suspended, um, but that is something we need to, you know, at the right time, talk to policymakers about. And if nonprofits really are impacted in Massachusetts, you know, that's something we need to really look at closely because we used to have it. Um, and it does incentivize some people to give and, and others to give a little bit more. Um, and so I think really paying attention, talking to the experts, mm -hmm. um, collecting any data that you can and, and staying engaged, you know, with your subsector groups and, and with not the nonprofit association as much as you can um, will be key, you know, going forward this year. Thank you so much. Guys, I mean, I feel like we could talk for much longer, but this was really helpful. Um, could you each just, we'll have it, uh, all the information, bios and links to the website, but quickly, what are, you, what are your websites so people can? Um... Sure, Mass Creative is www.mass, M-A-S-S, hyphen creative, C-R-E-A-T-I-V dot org. Okay. Sure, um, and we're at massnonprofitnet.org. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Scott, for uh, really organizing this amazing conversation. I'm sure it's going to be ongoing. Um, yeah, have a good tonight. I don't know. <laughs> thank you to you both. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the great yeah. questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.